thank you for joining us today. We apologize for the glitches we have with our um, systems. We hope you are all logging on and not to worry, this is being recorded so you will be able to get a full recording of the presentation today. So welcome to Wellness Wednesdays. Thank you for joining us. I'm Anne Marie Medina. I am the Director of Corporate and Community Relations for the Tucson campus for University of Arizona Health Sciences. I'd also like to introduce you to Caroline Berger, who is our director up at our Phoenix campus, and Allison Otu, who serves as our executive director. Um, please leave a question in the chat box at the bottom. We will try and get to all of your questions today. We're gonna to do a presentation for about 20 minutes, and we'll have uh, about 10 minutes at the end for questions, so we'll extend a little longer. Hope all you can stay. Um, any questions we don't get to, I'm sure Dr. Gallinet will be happy to answer in the follow-up email that we send. So click the bottom of your screen, throw that question in there, and we'll get to those at the end. Um, look out for that post. We will have a link to the recording, so you'll be able to see the full recording. We'll also send you links to all the resources and to Dr. Gallinet's slides today, so you will have all of that. Um, we'd love to hear from you, so please share your feedback on the survey that we provide and um, there'll also be a link to all of our past sessions in there so that you can go ahead and listen to them again. So please allow me to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Laura Mysette Gallinet earned her medical degree at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School and then completed her family medicine residency at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Jersey. In addition, she completed a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine and then completed the Certified Culinary Medicine Specialist Program at the Goldring Center for Culinary Medicine at Tulane University. Prior to joining the University of Arizona and Banner University Medicine, Dr. Mysant Gallinat was an Associate Professor of Clinical Family Medicine at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in the Department of Family Medicine, and was also the Assistant Director of the Somerset Family Medicine Residency at the Robert Wood Johnson's Barnabas Health. Her clinical interests include nutrition and lifestyle counseling within office visits and community outreach programs. And her educational and research interests include culinary medicine, physician wellness, and resiliency. I'm very excited to hear from Dr. Gallinet. Welcome, Laura. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Um, okay. Okay, thank you for such a nice welcome. And again, we apologize for our technical glitches, but you've asked me to speak about something I love to talk about, the health benefits of food. And so let's get started. It's an idea that's not new at all. Hippocrates was um, uh, knowing that food can be used for its medicinal qualities hundreds of years ago. Okay, and um, now that there is a um, discipline of culinary medicine, we're getting more and more scientific evidence, and I'd like to share some of that with you. Um, I like this one, um, and it really looked at all sorts of lifestyle practices, not just um, the food that you choose to eat, but it looked at people who may have been due to a family history at more genetic risk for coronary artery disease. So they, they looked at over 50,000 participants and saw whether or not they were, had genetic risk for it and did they have lifestyle risk because um, they were not following healthier lifestyles. And lo and behold, even people that have a high genetic risk, that if they followed a favorable lifestyle, they had almost 50% fewer cardiac events. And this is one of the key studies um, that looked at the Mediterranean um, dietary pattern. Um, started in Spain, um, and what Dr. Ramon Estrup did is he had three population groups. One, he sent extra virgin olive oil to them each week. Another group, he sent um, nuts, and the control group was following our diet in America in the day. If you remember back at like 2005, we were all following that low fat diet, which actually meant it was a high carb diet um, because to substitute the flavor of fat, 
much of the diet had high carbs. And what he found, even after three months, there was amazing benefit. But at the end of five years, they realized that there was a 60% decrease in either of the Mediterranean Mediterranean dietary patterns, whether you focused on nuts or extra virgin olive oil, there was a 30% reduction in cardiovascular deaths and stroke. But he did notice a benefit in three months. And it wasn't, they looked at all sorts of blood tests. And they also looked at hemoglobin A1C for diabetics, and that benefited within just a few months. But what um, they found was that there was an improvement in blood pressure and cholesterol, insulin sensitivity, and they started looking at inflammatory markers. And they even found a few newer ones that weren't looked at before. Things like interleukin-2, um, tumor necrosis factor, um, different um, components of oxidative stress, and um, all of those improved when following a Mediterranean diet. At the same time, people in pain started looking at, um, does diet actually affect pain from migraines or arthritis, rheumatoid or osteoarthritis? And they found they were able to tease out that it was omega-3 fatty acids for people with migraines, that if you ate, um, cold water fish or um, the nuts, which have the omega-3 fatty acids, people with migraines had decreased frequency and didn't, use to, didn't need to use as many meds and had a higher quality of life. Um, the same with people with arthritis and what um, they tried to find out why. And extra virgin olive oil, as any plant-based food, have certain phytonutrients. Um, this, what they isolated was olecanthal, and they found it was very similar in action to ibuprofen. Um, so they're really looking at the root of how can eating healthier, how does it change our metabolism in our body so that we can live longer and hopefully develop less disease. And so for those of you who like pictures, here is a um, drawing of someone who has rheumatoid arthritis. And you'll see that all of these things on the right side, those are all the inflammatory markers that they follow in patients. And they found if they ate healthier, those inflammatory markers decreased in addition to the patients feeling less pain. And so um, in, they looked at different foodstuffs. Some people who are watching may have gout and they've realized, you know, if I eat cherries when they're in season, I have less symptoms because um, there is a component in cherries that um, will decrease inflammatory markers. In fact, the former um, pharmacist I was working with in New Jersey just got a grant to take a look at that. Um, blackberries, other other fruits can be used to lower inflammatory markers. Um, but it's not just pain. Um, it affects our mind and our cognition. And so Morris did this key study back in 2015 um, with the MIND diet. It was the Mediterranean combination with the DASH diet. And they followed people. Um, they suggested a dietary pattern and they followed people to see whether or not they um, were compliant with it. And they found that the people who did at the end of five years, almost five years, um, those who followed the guidelines scored better on psychometric tests and had 55% less cognitive decline um, by following a certain um, eating pattern. And so, it's not just our mind, it's not just arthritis. If you or a loved one have any of these issues, the way that you eat will affect the course of that illness. Um, and what they've also studied um, are people who eat a certain way. There are foods that are high glycemic and there's foods that are low glycemic. 
Um, meaning if you eat some if you eat some candy if you drink some juice your blood sugar is going to spike within the hour um, and if you're eating more whole foods meaning you're cooking from scratch and hopefully many people watching are starting to do that in the midst of COVID. i know i am um, so that if you're eating more whole foods whole grains if you're eating the orange instead of drinking the orange juice, not only will it improve the blood sugar because um, uh, your blood sugar will rise, what happens to our body when that rises, so do our insulin levels. And some of the research is showing that it's the high insulin levels, for instance, looking at risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, that that high insulin level causes amyloid beta protein, which is one of the markers that um, are found in patients with Alzheimer's disease, that that particular protein is cleared at a much slower rate from our brains when we eat high glycemic foods and have a chronically high insulin level. And there's also more deposits of the tau -phos Correlated proteins, which are another marker for Alzheimer's disease. And so they actually performed MRIs on patients um, as they're following certain diets, and that's how they came to these, um, these conclusions. And so right now, I'd like you to take a moment and reflect on your own eating habits. What did you eat so far today? What's a typical day? What kind of snacks do you use? Um, what's your go-to beverage? Is it water or is it soda, juice? Um, but let's first talk about what oil do you use for cooking? I'd like to convince you that extra virgin olive oil is a very good fat. Um, yes, it's more expensive than um, corn oil or other vegetable oils, but corn oil is more with an omega-6 fatty acid picture, which is more pro-inflammatory. But extra virgin olive oil, a mono and saturated fat, it's not only the fat, but it's the polyphenols, which we started to talk about a little bit earlier. I had the opportunity to chat with Dr. Estruk a couple of years ago at one of the conferences, and he felt that the greatest benefit of a Mediterranean um, eating pattern is because of the extra virgin olive oil and all of its polyphenols. So far, we know that our bad cholesterol in our body um, does oxidize um, after we eat, and um, that oxidation process puts you more at risk for having a heart attack after a meal. Um, but extra virgin olive oil will reduce that oxidizability. In addition, it helps our healthier um, HDL cholesterol will get bigger and move throughout our bodies so it can remove the cholesterol in our body. I love this study. Um, it was done by a number cruncher who took a look at mortality data that they also had what the person's eating pattern was like. And he declared that if we're, Americans are eating too much of the items on the left. Too much salt, why? Because we're eating canned foods that have a lot of salt in them. Um, we're eating processed meats. But look to the right. There are six things that you can change in your diet and that will um, uh, reduce your chance of having um, cardiovascular death. So let's just look at whole grains for a minute. And so, unfortunately, most Americans consume only half the recommended amount of fiber, um, but the studies have shown that um, people who eat whole grains on a regular basis have a decreased risk of all-cause mortality of almost 10% and cardiovascular mortality by 15%. And I was asked to comment on how can you keep a healthy weight. And one suggestion is make sure you're always having a quarter of your plate be whole grains. And people that followed um, 
eating whole grains on a regular basis had less weight gain over a 24 year period. So that is definitely one suggestion. But what is eating healthy? Let's start with what it is not. And this is our standard American diet. I go to these nutrition conferences. They call it the sad diet because it really is sad that there's really no fruits and vegetables. I'm sorry, potato chips and french fries are not a vegetable. Very low in complex carbohydrates, but it's high in the refined carbohydrates and we're a fast food nation. Um, and what's resulting is the obesity epidemic, not only in adults, but now in, in children, that we're eating foods that are very dense in calories, but it has no nutrition. So we're really undernourished. And so this is an example of an anti-inflammatory diet. I learned this back in my integrative medicine fellowship from Dr. Andrew Weil. And he expanded it it's not just the Mediterranean way of eating, but what about the Okinawan Blue Zone diet that Asian foods like mushrooms and some of their spices like turmeric, um, all in soy products, adenami beans, all of those are healthy components with healthy phytonutrients that can create benefit in our bodies. And I do want to point out that the very tip, which means you don't eat it too much, is dark 70% chocolate. So eat it rarely, limit it to less than one ounce. Okay, and um, another great resource is the Harvard School of Public Health. They have a nutrition source website and each year they partner with the Culinary Institute of America. And I've gone to this conference four or five times. That's where I met Dr. Estruk, that we really need to promote plant forward, healthy eating, but do it in such a way that you make it craveable. What are the oils, the way that you prepare it, the spices you use, so that when given a smorgasbord of food, you're going to want to eat this over fast food. Um, and it's healthier, you crave this. And so that's what culinary medicine is all about. How can we cook it in such a way to maximize the health benefits? And how can we make it delicious and craveable? Because no one wants to eat a cardboard box, which sometimes healthy diets over the years, that's what it tasted like. I know I've been watching this for you know 50 plus years. And so the health benefits of plant-based eating is because of the micronutrients in plants, um, their vitamins and their minerals, the bioactives that you saw the list of all the health issues that um, are, can be affected. And it's not that you just eat one particular vegetable and one particular grain. You really want to try everything because the phytonutrients work synergistically. So you really need to have all colors of the rainbow on your plate. And speaking of plates, this is Harvard's um, healthy eating plate. Um, and there is the website at the bottom if, and there's lots of educational materials. Um, half of your plate are fruits and vegetables. And notice I highlighted the potatoes and French fries don't count. The other half of your plate a quarter of the plate are your grains and um, healthy whole grains and a quarter of your plate are healthy protein. So no, you may not wanna get cancer. So don't eat those processed lunch meats. Um, instead, have um, something that is more vegetable um, protein in origin. And we're not saying avoid all animal protein, but you use it more as a condiment. So you may want to create a stir fry that has half your plate of vegetables and you're having it over some nice whole grains and you're using um, legumes, beans, um, adaname beans or other beans, along with just a smidgen of um, healthy animal protein so that you still can eat the foods that 
you may have always enjoyed, but you're changing the way you're flipping it. You're flipping so that you're eating less animal protein and more plant, healthy plant protein. So in the few minutes that are remaining, I'm gonna talk about how can you maintain a healthy weight in addition to adding whole grains. First of all, I hate the word diet. I'm sure most of you on this line hate the word diet. That makes me feel deprived. Um, I wanna choose to eat healthier. How can I eat healthier so that I can live longer, have more energy, have less depression? So um, it's not just food. I needed to include this because I am a family physician, um, integrative doctor. You never say it's all because of the food. It's are you doing lifestyle? Um, are you following a healthy lifestyle? Are you practicing mind-body exercises? Are you meditating? Are you being physically active? Do you smoke? And the healthy weight will come when you're following all of these other issues. And it doesn't matter when you do, even these older adults, that they still were able to have a 40% reduction in all causes of death and a 30% reduction in cardiovascular disease. Death. So I wanted to spend a few minutes on mindful eating. Um, and if you're not familiar with this term, it's what it's not is going to get fast food and eat it while you're going from meeting to meeting. Um, it's not rushing. It's eating at home. It's putting away the phones and not watching television, but really seeing what's on your plate and say, oh, am I still hungry? Should I eat this? Or mm, maybe I am full and I don't need to finish my plate even though my parents told me I needed to, children were starving throughout the world. Um, and so here are some of the studies that show that the really the, the most important first step is um, how fast you eat, how much are you putting on your plate? And um, there was a study that looked at women. They found women who actually didn't have any recent stress or depression. Don't know who they are, but apparently there were that said that. And they fed them two types of meals, a healthier monounsaturated fat meal. Um, and when they ate that, their inflammation, um, the markers for inflammation did not go up. If they still were without stress or depression, if they ate a high fat meal, that yes, their markers went up. But what happens in the real world when you really do have stress and depression? It really didn't matter whether you ate a healthy meal or not, your markers still went up. And if you ate fast, less than 15 minutes to complete that meal, your markers went up too. And it really didn't matter what was on your plate, how many calories, or what your BMI, how what your body habitus was, how much you were, whether you were thin or overweight, it didn't matter. Eating faster increases your markers. Um, and eating faster will also increase your pain if you're someone who's dealing with some chronic pain issues. So mindful eating, um, are you hungry? Am I eating because I'm bored or I'm stressed out or am I truly hungry? Maybe I need to do something else if I'm bored or stressed out instead of eating. And then um, eat slower, chew more. And that if you eat slower and chew more, you're not going to eat as much, but yet you will feel full. And so wrapping up, um, here is the long version of the tips. Um, be mindful, choose whole foods, um, add a salad, um, either at the beginning or the end, um, or use a soup. I, a good, easy way to add more in different vegetables, make it in a soup, put it on your salad, make a smoothie, um, put it into a stir fry. And so think about that protein flip. Um, use meat more as a condiment for special occasions um, and explore um, our legumes, our um, beans and lentils, less expensive 
um, and really very versatile. And remember to eat that handful of nuts and seeds daily. Um, and if you want the Cliff Notes version, Michael Pollan, who I love, um, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And so that's it. And thank you, Anne-Marie, for checking our chat box to see how, um, what questions we have. Ooh. You're muted, Anne-Marie. Thank you. <laughs> it seems like a technology challenge day for me. Okay. Um, so thank you so much. We appreciate that. We do have a lot of questions. And so let me just get into them. And like I said, for those of you who are needing to jump off, we will provide all the answers to all these questions in our follow-up email. So um, there was a question on what is the Mediterranean combo with the DASH diet? Um, well, what's interesting after going to these nutrition conferences, the DASH diet was what was developed in the United States because people didn't think that um, Americans would really welcome um, a Mediterranean diet. So they're pretty much the same, except the Mediterranean diet has more um, fish, um, probably more beans, um, and they really promote extra virgin olive oil. Um, and uh, the DASH diet may say, for instance, use any vegetable oil, um, but knowing that most vegetable oil has, are made from omega-6 fatty acids, like your corn oil, which is just so cheap, um, but yet it is just so pro-inflammatory. So um, it's like, it's taking the boat out of, of um, both the, um, more European way of eating and what they thought Americans would eat. And, and there was a question on if the Mediterranean and Asian diets actually provide enough protein. Oh, oh, um, I love going to this one conference, um, Chris Gardner from Stanford. He believes Americans are eating way too much protein. You do not need to eat any animal protein. If you're eating um, you're, if you're substituting beans, um, you're gonna be eating enough protein. Um, so that's the big um, American myth that we're not getting enough protein, um, which may be um, because of the meat um, uh, uh, industry to really promote the, the use of animal protein. Um, so, uh, don't worry, you're going to be eating enough protein. It's in dairy, um, it's in green leafy vegetables. You're going to be eating enough protein. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to one more question and then we will answer all the rest of these in the follow up email. Um, one of the questions was um, that uh, what should you eat that has more iron? and proteins if you're wanting to substitute that meat in your diet? What is the best way? Because there was a question about if um, there was a question about that the lectins in legumes were bad for you. So okay. how do you balance all of that? Okay. Um, that your green leafy vegetables have um, lots of iron um, in them. Uh, and your beans, I mean, they're, at one of the conference, it was what has more protein, beans and, and iron, black beans versus red meat. And you know, it was really the black beans. Right. So um, I would, I think you would get enough iron with eating your, oh, some whole grains, some, uh, some, green leafy vegetables, but specifically the green leafies um, and beans. And I did happen to see a question in the chat. Is there a difference between canned versus um, dried beans? Dried beans are a lot less expensive. If you have the time, use the dried beans. If you choose canned, make sure your can is BPA free because 
I could talk about environmental exposures too. <laughs> we'll do that on another session. But that's another <laughs> session. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, Laura, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And like I said, we will get to all of these because there are a lot of questions in our chat box and I apologize that we don't have the time to get to all of them. Okay. We will follow up with them. Uh, yes, thank right. you. And I will try to answer the questions like even giving you lists of things that have iron in it. So that way you could okay. use that follow-up email for as a reference. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you. So thank you so much, Dr. Galanath, for that wonderful presentation. Um, and a special uh, thank you to all of you for joining us and being patient with us as we had our challenges today. You're going to get an email with an evaluation for the event today, and it'll include the links, the slides, links to all of our presentations, a calendar of events for health sciences. Um, next week, be sure to join us. We have Dr. David Sabara, who is the Director of the Laboratory for Social Connectedness and Health with the University of Arizona Department of Psychology. He's going to be talking about relationships and health and how to overcome obstacles and build healthy relationships, which I know for some have been a challenge during isolation. So on behalf of us at the University of Arizona Health Sciences, be safe, be well, and of course, always bear down and mask up. Thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye.